The second school of psychology we're going to look at in this series of mini lectures is called the Functionalist School. Uh, this, uh, the big name here is a fellow by the name of William James, who is also considered the father of American psychology. Now, in contrast to William Wundt, who we saw in our last lecture, uh, who he, Wundt, tried to understand the nature of uh, con and structure of consciousness, looking at the elements of consciousness. Here, James' goal was to understand more in a global stream of conscious type of idea. And, in, and he's particularly famous for, under, for looking and, and trying to understand why animals and humans have a particular, um, a, a particular type of consciousness and why uh, the functions of the consciousness developed and evolved in a particular manner. Uh, there had to be some sort of reason for their existence and development. Now, James uh, established his psychological laboratory at Harvard in the year 1875. And um, then in 1890, which was not really quite so uh, soon afterwards, he wrote a very influential textbook called The Principles of Psychology, which is still read by scholars today. And actually, in a sense, the textbooks that, you, that you're using in Introduction to, Introduction to Psychology is probably based on the same uh, structure of, uh, uh, that he, he established then. Now, according to the functionalist view, consciousness and thinking is relevant only in relationship to behavior, right? In his psychology book, in that uh, book that I mentioned, he actually put it this way in his own words, and I quote, my thinking is first and last and always for the sake of my doing, end quote. Now, James, William James and other members of the Functionist School were really very strongly influenced by that very influential book, uh, uh, The Origin of Spe Species, by Charles Darwin. Uh, and Darwin's theory of natural selection. Now, this meant that any characteristic that an organism has is that came about only because it proved useful during the course of evolution, right? In other words, they must serve some sort of purpose or function, right? So that's where you get the name functionalists. Functionists believe that Darwin's theory applied to psychological characteristics as well as the physical characteristic. In other words, just as some animals uh, have strong muscles, and develop strong muscles and allow, allow them to run fast and escape their enemies. Well, the same way the human brain uh, and human characteristics, according to the fun functionalist school of thought, must have adapted in order to, per to, to perform a particular function and serve the betterment of the human experience. Now, structure, like structuralism, which we saw in the last lecture, functionalism is not really a, a, an active school of psychology today. But on the other hand, structuralism is completely dead. Functionalism lives on in its evolved uh, uh, state. In other words, the basic principles of functionalism have been absorbed into psychology and they continue to be extremely important. Uh, for instance, the field of evolutionary psychology applies Darwinian theory of natural selection to human and animal behavior. And uh, it's an important theoretical framework. Evolutionary psychologists, which is a valid uh, uh, sub-specialty uh, in psychology, accept that functionalist basic assumption, that, which is that in order to understand psychological characteristics, including memory and emotion and personality and whatever you might have, you must consider the adaptive function of those particular constructs. So, and, and truth is, evolutionary psychology is often used as an explanation for many different behaviors, including romantic attraction, stereotypes and prejudice, and even for the causes of many psychological disorders and pathologies. Now, a key term that you read, we, we need to connect to the idea of, evol of functionalist uh, theory is the idea of fitness, not physical fitness, right? But fitness in here means the extent to which any particular characteristic assists the organism, be it human or non-human, to survive and reproduce at a higher rate than other members of that species. Um, so, a uh, more fit organism 
because they have that particular uh, aspect of fitness, are more likely uh, to pass on their genes to successive and later generations. And that means those characteristics are going to become more likely, more part of that species nature. Um, so like, let's, let's take an example, right? So we know that men and women look for different uh, things when they choose their mates, right? Women might prefer strong, wealthy men, right? Because that affords them a better chance for their children to survive. On the other hand, men might, pre might uh, prefer uh, women who are young because they're more fertile and they're more likely to have children. So that's generally what might, uh, might happen. Now, of course, this is, uh, uh, might be true then for other species also. And actually there is some uh, experimental evidence that for instance, they did a study on the mating habits of uh, rats that live in subways. Uh, and why, of course, why do they do that? Because they want to control their, their uh, reproductive habits. And they found that female rats prefer male rats who are well-traveled, which means about seven blocks from their home, uh, that they um, have ge uh, healthy genes and that they smell good. And I don't want to necessarily know what they call smelling good. But, okay, so you can see that there is some parallels and it can still be used. Of course, there are some scientific issues with the theory of evolution, um, and they're much too complicated. We're not going to talk about them here. I'd love to give an extra lecture on that. Um, and all, but even though it's impossible to conduct an empirical evolutionary experiment, right? So in other words, we can't actually, um, or we have not until now actually made an empirical exper uh, experiment to show from uh, evolution from one species to the next. Although we have shown very good evolution within species, um, nonetheless, it's really able to, to find supporting evidence. Um, by looking at fossils. Of course, that doesn't make it falsifiable, which is a problem, on the, which is one of the big problems. But on the other hand, when you talk about psychological characteristics, it's impossible to find uh, fossil evidence because there's no fossil evidence for things like emotion, intelligence, and personality. Actually, because of it being difficult to actually empirically test uh, evolutionary theories, there's always a chance that the explanations are that we apply are made up after the fact in order to account for our observed data. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean it's not a useful and important theory because it generates a lot of research, it makes a framework for understanding, and this is the legacy which we have from the functionalist school and from William James.